Yes, what's good, people? I'm Jams. We've got Corey from Trap Mafia here and Cleo from Kizaya and Co. And today we're going to be running a seminar called From Passion to Profession. And this is basically just like an informal chat about how to take something you love doing and kind of like forge a career from it. I know we've been doing a lot of stuff around arts development and ADP. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to intro my two very good friends here. Um, we'll start with Cleo. Cleo, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Hi. Um, so yeah, as Jan said, we go, we go way back um, to the days when I was working at Trendset. So I started off in fashion, actually, um, studying that. And then as my journey has gone on, I went into events. I dabbled in events a little bit. Um, I've done my own events, Girl Boss UK, that was like one of the big ones for me. Um, and then since that, I've just I've done a little bit of artist management. I managed a DJ for a while. And my last business venture, or the last two, well, actually, I started a um, management company, music management company. And my last venture during lockdown was I started a little hair oil business. So I sell hair oil now. This is going to be my natural hair journey. So I thought I might make some money out of it. <laughs> but yeah, that's me. So if you had to like categorize or like put everything that you did into one sentence, how would you describe that? You can't. You can't. I'm just I just whatever I want to do, I just do it at that point. And obviously everything that I've said has been at different points in my life. But I would say for me, I'm just um I try to condense it. I've always tried to, how can I help someone else? So yeah. when I was doing um, events, it was obviously, when I was working, doing my own events, Girl Boss UK, yeah. that was, how can I help other young women become girl bosses or, or speak to other girl bosses or learn from other girl bosses? How can I help them there? Um, with, the hair, with the hair stuff, like I said, I'm on a hair journey. There's loads of other um, people, women and men that are on hair journeys. So I'm helping them with my knowledge of that I also work with young people I want to help them so maybe that is how you would condense me in a sentence is that I want to help people in different capacities but that's what it is amazing Corey tell us a bit about yourself obviously we know you from track mafia but how did you yes. how did your journey get to track mafia um my journey got to track mafia um I was a fat dude back in I guess the early 2000s um I was a raver <laughs> And then after I finished raving, um, I started eating kebabs and basically drinking too much and just leading a not too healthy lifestyle. So I just put on loads and loads of weight. I found running because a friend of mine um, went to go and run the marathon. So I started running, um, spent the next couple of years losing loads and loads of weight. Um, I ran, um, I think my first marathon in like 2007. And I basically realized that my body was weak, <laughs> but my mind was strong. And from that point, I was like, oh, like this running thing, it's, it's, it's like helping me deal with things that I didn't even know existed in my, in my head. Um, so I went on this kind of running journey, lost loads of weight, did my running qualifications because I was already um, working in sports development and youth work. So I was like coaching football, table tennis, that sort of stuff. Um, so my boss kind of said to me, oh, boom, would you like to, to do your running qualifications? So I said, yeah, sure. So I did my running qualifications and I just started taking small groups of runners out. Um, at that point, I had maybe one or two groups going on one ladies group running from city hall in westminster and another one running from where i was based at paddington recreation ground um a guy called eugene introduced me to charlie dark um who was running run them crew he said to me ah oh, can you and a friend of yours ellie wood set up rdc west so we set up run them crew west run them crew west was running over in west london and me and some friends who were running at random crew west were like oh we want to get better as runners. We want to get faster. We want to get stronger. Um, let's do track. So my office was upstairs from a track. So we literally started doing track. We had friends that we had met from BT, like Bridge the Gap, which is other runners from different parts of the world who had more knowledge about running than us. So we kind of tapped them up. Um, I had my coaching qualifications. Um, so we started running other people were interested in in what it is that we were doing 
Um, so they wanted to join us. And because of the kind of people that we were, we told the story differently about running. And that, I guess, is where people started to discover us. It was about how we told the story about our running, about our pain when running. But we told the story a little bit differently because we spoke about us going for coffee before dinner in the evening. Then we spoke about raving and partying. So people are like, oh, hold on. These people who are runners, they're ravers <laughs> as well. They still drink, they still eat they're normal people and that's why people started to I guess not be afraid of track from that the Nike link came from the from after I started working with Nike I started working on their on a NRC app and then from then I started I guess designing more events with the point of getting more young people and adults into running but in a different way because we all know running is boring so my job is to spice it up to help more people get into it because I know how beneficial it is to people's mental health, their well-being, their bodies, all of it. Sick. So obviously um, we've been doing, me and Corey have been doing like a lot of work with the Hackney Empire um, and the main kind of aim is to help empower young people to kind of like go into professions that aren't normally your typical like straight out of school professions which was one of the main reasons that I wanted to do this Zoom especially at a time like this during like lockdown um, where unemployment can be like a real problem um, I really wanted to have a conversation about our journeys and the difficulties we kind of face turning what we love doing into a profession um, just because I feel like it can be so beneficial there's so many things that I see young people doing in their free time that they could earn money from that they may not necessarily have access to the knowledge of how to turn it into a profession, which kind of leads us perfectly into our first question, which is what is the biggest difficulty in turning your passion into your profession? So for you, Cleo, like when you were first getting into like stuff, let's say for example, with Trendset, what was the biggest stumbling block for you that you found? Um, Trendset was, was difficult um, for me because of my other commitments that I had. Um, so I was studying and I was working. So it's always difficult to um, manage a side hustle or a passion project um, when you're trying to pay bills or you've got commitments that you need to do, whether it's learning or, or whatever. Um, so that was, that was one of my biggest things. Um, that's always actually, because I, any side thing that I do, any passion project that I have, I always have my nine to five going alongside it. I'm a mum as well, so that's an added commitment and obviously full-time job, as you can imagine. Um, so for me, it's time, managing like the balance of time and also money, because everything I've done, I've self-funded myself. Um, I've self-funded myself, and I've self-funded. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so... If you, if you want to do something, can it cost you 10 grand and you've only got two grand saved? Like, what do you do? Bar oh, go into the bank or mm. bank of mum and dad or whatever. Do you know what I mean? You've got, you've got to do, you've got to make it work. But that is, is a struggle. So sometimes you will have to take an extra shift or whatever. Don't get your eyebrows done that month or whatever. So sacrifices have to be made. But it all works out and it's all, it's worth it, I would say. But yeah, that would be my, my biggest thing. What about you, Corey? What were the biggest like obstacles when you were first starting out? Um, I think my biggest obstacle was believing in myself that it was possible, as in because you have loads of ideas in your head and you're kind of, I found I was waiting for the right time when there's, there's no right time to jump off the edge of a cliff because that is... <laughs> realistically what Literally. you do when you decide to either go self-employed or to you don't become an entrepreneur I think you're always an entrepreneur you, you're just constantly searching for a, a vehicle for your entrepreneurship and that's what I that was the hardest part like believing in myself that I could do this and then after that the hardest part was um, getting other people to believe in what it is that I was doing because like we talk about community a lot yeah you can have this an amazing idea yeah you can have this amazing product but you can't do anything by yourself as in someone has to buy into it 
Like you're, yes, you do loads of things by yourself, but you cannot exist solely by yourself. So getting other people to buy into either what it is that you're selling or that you're interested in, or like just buying into your passion. So the the big the hardest part for me was getting people to sorry getting to a place where I believed that I could do it like that was that was that was the hardest part like getting to a place where like you think to yourself it like it will happen like I just have to jump I just have to do it because if I wait for the right time it's just not gonna happen if I wait for somebody else to do it for me it's not gonna happen so yeah. Like there is a wrong time to do it. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not a right time. You touched on a really like um important thing actually, like self belief. Like outside of actually, you know, like deciding this is the thing that I want to go for, what are the things that you guys do to kind of like inspire that self belief within yourself? How do you get yourself to that place mentally? Me? Clear, yeah. Yeah. Um I think for me, I've always been quite a confident person. Um, I don't think, for me, it wasn't about um, believing in myself. I think it was more believing in my skills, if that makes sense. Mm. So, because I've got the gift of the gab, I can sell snow to Eskimos. I can do all of that. But selling a service or selling a product that's yours and it's like your baby, do you know what I mean? So it, then it becomes more of a, can I actually make this business work rather than for me it wasn't like um can i do it i i know i can but can i sustain it can i maintain it that was that was what it was for me and how i've done it as i just how it overcame is i just done it and i just i just okay right today i'm gonna do girl boss i've been thinking about this for months and months and months today's the day and i've just started what, uh, whatever i did I can't even remember what I first did, but whatever it was. And then once you take that, it's like going to the gym, in it? Like, to get up to go to the gym is like, oh, I can't be bothered. But then once you're there, you do, like, an intense hour and you feel so much better afterwards. For me, that's what it was like. It's just that initial getting there was a bit difficult. But then when I decided that I'm doing it, then we do it. And if it fails, it fails. And if it doesn't, then that's even better. Like, but at least I tried. You understand? So, yeah, and you, you know, even when you fail, like I think those failures like bring you very valuable lessons as well that you wouldn't have otherwise learned. Do you know what I mean? Definitely, and it just makes you a better, better entrepreneur, a better person, a better, a better business person for the next time. We, well, I started when I was a teenager, for almost a decade in this. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I couldn't do, I couldn't do what I do now when I was 18 because I didn't have the experience, I didn't have the knowledge, I didn't have the contacts the network, et cetera, the money, all of that stuff. So, yeah, fa- failure is part of life in all aspects. What about you, Corey? What, what kind of things do you do, like, holistically to just get your mind in the right place? Um, I, I guess I go through this, um, how can I put it, like, show, show reel in my head <laughs> of times where things have gone well and, and, time, and times when things times when things have gone well and times when things have gone badly because I want things to go well again and I don't want to have that feeling (laughs) of when things didn't go well but what's interesting is similar to what you said is you learn from those experiences like you learn from those mess ups and it means that you do it better the next time and that's what I found like every single mistake that I've made or everything that hasn't gone the way it should have done or that I thought it should have done has taught me a valuable lesson that has helped position me or put me in the place that I am in now as like people will say to me are oh, how how do you how do you get to a not where you are but how do you get into that position and I'm like me personally it was a series of oh wow cool yeah yeah, yeah I'll do that and I really want to do this. Like, if you said to me 10, 15, 20 years ago, where will you be? This is not where I, I, I thought I would be. I, I wouldn't have reached this high. As in, I wouldn't have said, this is, this is what I think I want to accomplish. Like, I would never have said, oh, I would be doing this because it was never, ever on the cards. Like, it, it's, it's, it's always a series of 
forks in the road and that is you're on one road and something else opens up and that other thing has opened up because of what you've done on this particular road but had you not worked on that particular road that thing would never have opened up you could have made another choice and that's what i have found like keeps me going like the fact that there are always new choices like for me if i sit at a crossroads at a, at a dead end for too long it's like it's my fault like i messed up so i guess how i stay motivated is i'm i'm always i'm always working towards a fork so just off the back of that question um for somebody who's starting out what advice would you give them um clear um make a plan whether that's on paper a visual mood board um on your notes in your phone, whatever, however you work best, um, I'd say make a plan for me. That's and I love like to do lists, checklists, and all that's that's how I work as well. That makes it easier for me because they're right. I'm gonna do an event, I need a venue, I need this, I need that, blah blah blah. So I can tick the things off. So it's always really, really good to have a plan. I'd say, um, use your network because you've got friends, family, colleagues, school teachers, whatever. Um, everyone can help in a small, small way. So take advantage of your like what's around you that you don't have to necessarily pay for. Um, don't give up. And I know that's so cliche in all of these panels. Everyone always says that, but honestly, I don't think any of us would be where we are today if we gave up. So it really, really is important to just keep going. Like you are going to fall down. You might lose money. Your boss owes me bare peas. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's it's fine. Like it's just it's just a part of it. And you just you take that L and you take the, the lessons that you learn, you move on and you, you try again and you just you just keep going. Whether you stick with the same thing or you try something different, yeah, just keep going and and don't be afraid to ask for help. What about you, Corey? Um, my advice to people is always um, lead with passion and find your superpower. Um, and what I find is there's, there's far too many like superheroes out there that don't even know they're superheroes because they're, they're far too busy trying to be Superman or Batman or, or Robin, like people who already exist. <laughs> As in, we're all individuals. So what I say to people constantly is be you, be an individual stop trying to be someone else like Pele's gone Maradona's gone <laughs> Ronaldo's gone like be be you um and the reason why I say that is that's what people buy into people buy into your passion people don't buy into lives well they do but that's because they're silly <laughs> but <laughs> most people buy into passion and if people can see that passion like they'll follow you and as 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 it's not even callous, it's how marketing works nowadays in this day and age is people buy into people and then companies pay people so that they then buy into their products, which means that the people who follow them have now bought into their products. And I think there are far too many people who unfortunately still believe that we live in this beautiful fluffy world when we don't. Right? And you have to kind of prepare yourself for the real world it is that we live in right now. Yes, it's changing, but today, on this date, what's the date today? On Wednesday the 5th, this is the world that we live in. And I think the best way to prepare people for that is to be real and honest and truthful with them and say, we're working towards changing it back to this beautiful, nice world. But at the moment, these are the things that you have to do. And that is lead with your passion, be truthful, be honest, and be real with people. So another question that we had submitted was, how were you sure that your passion could be your profession? When, when did that point come for you both when you knew that, yeah, this is going to happen or this is what I want to do? Um, for me, I think when Girl Boss sold out tickets and no one even knew really what it was. And now there's a million types of 
um, girl boss events, um, which is the like, female empowerment events. There's like dime a dozen. But at the time, there were there wasn't too much in um in the UK at, at least. And yeah, when we sold out, like, and we still had like two weeks ago, I had to open up more tickets. I had to find chairs at churches and do all of these mad things. And I was just like, it wasn't even like, oh, my passion is going to be my profession. It was just like, there's a need. And I can bring that to these people. I can bring what these people need to them in Girlboss UK events or however, whatever different capacities that I've done it in. So that's when I just knew that me, what I was doing nine to five, and I've never been happy in my nine to five anyways, and I've had various jobs. Me working for someone, it's just, I just wasn't built like that. Like um, Corey said earlier, if you're, you're born like this way, either you are supposed to be your own boss or you're not. I don't think you can be taught how to be a creative or how to be a biz, like an entrepreneur. Like you just, either you are or you're not. And me working for someone, it's just never been me. I've, ne I've just never taken um, direction authority well. Like I was always in trouble at school and all of those things. But yeah, so when I realized that I could do this and I was A, helping people, B, like breaking even, it's just like, okay, we just need to keep going. Just keep going. So, yeah, that was it for me. How about you, Corey? At what point in your journey did you, like, have a realisation? Was it a gradual thing? Or did yeah, it have, like, it was a light super gradual. It? Nah, it was, it was super gradual and then a straw that broke my back. As in, so I had been working towards that goal for maybe two years. And... I I kind of sat down one day and I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like that's that was literally my face. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like this is and so at the time I was a sports development officer at um for Westminster. And then at the same time I was running uh Good Gym in Westminster and Hackney. So for people who don't know what Good Gym is, basically an organization that runs to help people. So I would organize a run to go and help like a, a homeless person's organization deliver oh, food I've done to that homeless before. people. Yeah. I've done that before. Um, I sanded down a church. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. I used to organize that in Westminster and Hackney. Then I had the full-time job. Then I was running RDC West and doing some other bits and pieces. So the more and more I took on, I guess the more I built up the... the alternative income as it were and then I kind of so I had about four or five different incomes coming in from jobs and I was like this running thing like I, I really like it this is cool like I'm getting paid to 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 run and I'm getting <laughs> fit I'm losing weight this is dope I'm meeting different people I've met creative people because prior to that I hadn't really been around actually that's a lie I was in the music business not music business but working in music but outside of music like, I don't think I'd ever really come across a proper creative director or an art director or a lot of the people that I met from, from Shoreditch or from Dalston, some of these jobs. Still to this day, I, I, I don't know what it is that you do, but even back then, I was like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what's this job that you do? I've, nev I've never heard of it. And like that new world to me outside of music and outside of the community stuff that I was doing and the mandem, it was new to me and that's why I was really drawn to it. And then the more time I spent with these people, the more I was like, oh, hold on. I'm more like you lot than I am like this life that I've been living for, for however many years. And now I fully understand why, even though I've been immersed in this life, even though I love my friends, what surrounds that life isn't really what I'm into. And the only thing keeping me in it is my friends. So if I take, I know this is ridiculous, but when you then take the friends out and you just have the framework, I'm like, ah, it, it wasn't really my life. And the more people I met, the more people, I guess, really showed me that what I was thinking was right, that I, I could do more. And that's no disrespect whatsoever for people who are still doing their, doing that. Like that's their love, that's their passion. I hadn't found my love or my passion yet. And that's, that's when I started to transition because I was like, oh, like I, I enjoy this more. This don't feel like work, but people are paying me. And I've been told that that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to follow passion. But 
all of these things not had been hidden from me, but because I'd lived in another world, I hadn't explored them as much. So the point that I made the decision I had to jump was when I was like, I'm really unhappy doing this stuff. I'm having more fun doing work that isn't my real work. So how do I, how, how do I make this full-time work whereby I don't need this anymore? And that's when I started to transition. I started making phone calls, started having meetings, being like, what do you do? How did you do that? Mm. Can I do it? No? Okay. Yeah. And then I would move on. And all the time I'd be making notes and I'd, I, I spoke to some really interesting, cool people. And then by the end of it all, I just had this black book. And when I say black book, I'm talking like a notebook, A4 sheet, just filled with notes from really smart people. And I was like, okay, so my man did it like that and she did it like this and this is how I could do it. And then I spoke to my missus and a few other people and they were like, what you should do is make a list of all of your skills and then work out what you can do with them. So that's what I did. I wrote down all of what I thought were my skills. I'm like, okay, if I put all of this together, someone must campaign me for this. And that's, that's what I did. And that was, that, like, that was the moment when I was like, no, nah, I, I, can't, I can't come here anymore. I can't do this anymore. This is killing me. Mad. So... <laughs> <laughs> Just said that. It's mad, you know, because I remember having that moment as well. Like mm. when, I, when I was working, I used to work for a trading company in um in. Oh, yeah. I remember when you did that. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Look, and I remember at the time, my music was picking up, and like for the longest, like I'd wanted to do it, but I just never thought it could be a a viable thing to get paid from yet. And yeah. I remember having that moment one day as well. It was like. I was getting booked a ridiculous amount. I was doing like one or two bookings a week, like used up all my annual leave by like February. I'd use all 24 days. It's like so annoying. Like, and then I remember going, I went on, I supported Kano on tour and I'll never forget like I had to tell like a mad lie to my manager because I didn't tell anybody at work what I did. Just you didn't tell anybody anywhere what you did, Jan. Yeah, I didn't tell anywhere. Like nobody, <laughs> but yeah, more so no environment that it was. I didn't want them to look at me any differently. It was like majority middle class people who like work in finance. That's their history. That's their entire life. And I remember one day, like I had a show on a Wednesday in Scotland, and I got the plane to Scotland on the Wednesday night. Bearing in mind, my annual leave is finished by this point. So I've done this rave, done a sick rave in Scotland. All my mates are going out after the rave to party. And I'm thinking, I've got to go and sleep for an hour because I'm going to the airport in the morning. I need to go back to work. I need to be at work for 9 a.m. Like, I'm getting changed in the airport into my suit. And, like, I remember being on the plane and landing in Heathrow. And I was like, I've had enough. <laughs> yeah. I've even had enough for you. I was like, I've had <laughs> enough. I can't do this no more. I can't. Like, it's either I have to choose one or the other and start to take the risk. And I think when you get to that point where you really can't manage anymore. I feel like taking the risk becomes a lot more appealing because you've seen what's on the other side of the fence. You know that, okay, like I've been sustaining this for this long. So now if I can apply myself to this fully, when I've only been able to give 30%, imagine what the possibilities could look like. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is I then went into the office and I was like, oh, can, can I speak to, to, to you please? And I had my letter of resignation and I was like, I just want to let you know, um, I'm handing in my resignation. Um, I've been with you guys since like 2004 or whenever it was. So it wasn't like I started there last week. Um, and they were like, where are you going? And I was like, I, I don't know. Um, and they said, oh, <laughs> and they, and they said to me, what are you going to do? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes like, you have to do that. Yeah. You just have to take the risk. Like, I remember when Jam, you told me that you quit your job, and I was just like, oh, I'm so jealous. I'm like, that is like one of my goals to just be, but I'm just, I've always just been afraid to how am I going to pay my bill? Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, it's such a fear of mine. But what lockdown has shown me is that bills or no bills, I've got to live my best life because we don't know what's happening. And when I leave this earth, God willing, it's in a very, very long time, I want to leave <laughs> knowing that I've done everything 
that yeah. I wanted to do under my terms and that made me happy. And that's what I just wanted to add. Like when I've done Girl Boss, when I booked all of these artists for Stamina and Rip the Runway and Trenta and all of these things, the feeling that I had, the joy that I had from doing it, even like now when I'm doing music videos for my artists and that, like I don't get that from a nine to five. Mm. I don't get that feeling. I just don't. And it's not, it's not even about like making loads of money from something. Do you know what I mean? It's just about being passionate about something and having and not having to ask the man if you could do it. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. It's just like, well, this is what I want to do, and this is mine, so I can do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's so empowering. <laughs> exactly. It's and I feel like there's no better feeling than that. I feel like for me, that's the definition of being alive. Yeah. You know I mean? Honestly. It's like it's priceless. You cannot I'd rather be an adult. Honestly. Having said that's that, I wouldn't people. advise anybody to quit their job who like No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> You're responsible. I've, people. I've had Don't meetings with people and they were like, Oh, like, who do you have to run this by? And I was like, no one like what do you want to do and they're like so you don't have to no it's it's it's, it's our thing yeah i, I don't like, think oh. um i don't think it's, it's wise to be irresponsible and i feel like if you are going to quit your job they might have to put things in place like all right yeah. i can i can survive for the next three to six months without doing anything do you know yeah. what i mean like be smart about your risk taking because what you don't want to do is then fall into debt which leads to depression and all of these things that you just don't need. So definitely have a plan, support network, whatever, mum, dad, sister, cousin, friend, like, do you know what I mean? Even if you just, I don't know. I don't know. There's things that you can do. And I think this is for, for young people. So it's, it's, I wish I had this stuff when I was young because they can make a difference so much earlier on where we were, well, I was like basically an adult when I had the guts to do something for myself. A young adult so the younger you can get in there the better cool so that leads us into our next question um advice for if you're <clears throat> sorry advice for if your parents want you to take an academic route but you want to follow your passion what advice would you guys have for that do you guys have any personal experience of that like <laughs> to be kind of like entrepreneurial but you're kind of like clashing with your parents I think most parents are like from that generation anyways our parent generation are very fearful of working for yourself because they don't understand it it's not anything that most of them haven't done themselves so it's like doctor lawyer teacher academic go to school get your degree da 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 da, da. for me my dad definitely didn't pressure me and my mom she was like this is what I want you to do but if you're going to do that then I support you in that. So I was very lucky. Um, and I think my mum, if you ask her, she would tell you that she said that because she knows it doesn't matter what she said, I was going to do it. <laughs> so if you can't beat them, join them. Um, she knew I was always going to do. And the thing is, I change all the time. I said, one month I want to do this, then I want to do that. And my mum was very supportive. I can't even lie. But what the advice I would give if your parents are really, really on you, I'd just... Get some confidence and say, Mum, Dad, I love you, but it's my life. And if I fail at this, then that's going to be my failure and I'm going to learn from it. But you can't live your life for anyone, not even your parents. And, mm. and that's, that's just how I feel about it. And I would never infringe any of my wants or needs to my child or children. Because I'm not living their life. I don't know how they feel and what going to work makes them feel like or they're like depressed and can't get out of bed and do you know what I mean so just you gotta do what you gotta do what about That's you my sorry um, um my so my parents were very much we want you to go to school we want you to get a further your education However, what we also want you to do is be happy. So whatever choice you make, as no police, as long as no police come knocking on this door, we're off. <laughs> was that the police I'm knocking scared. on the door? <laughs> Sorry. That was so timely. 
Um, <laughs> That's my speaker. She was like, oh no, she's getting involved. <laughs> let me let me go turn it off. So she doesn't have to make it. Sorry. As um, no police come knocking at the door, and as long as like you're not not doing nothing, we're happy for you. Um, and I kind of went all the way through school expecting to get these awesome results. And when the GCSE envelope was burst open, there was nothing but failure in there, <laughs> apart from. <laughs> <laughs> apart from it goes, it goes like that sometimes yeah apart from the A star that I got for drama and um, what else what else I got another C for something and but because literally the entire board thought I was going to do so well in school the deputy head came to the yard and and held counsel with my mum on some how, how are we going to fix this like Corey's a smart boy <laughs> Like what's up, what's happened here? The whole thing, everyone knows like what has happened, and all it was was that I was smart, but I wasn't smart academically, as in like I wasn't good at learning in the way that they taught. I wasn't good at remembering in the way that they wanted me to remember. <laughs> However, I can recite every single Biggie Smalls lyric from when I was ten or eleven, sure. but I can't remember the people's um, algebra. Or, or whatever it was so I just found out that I didn't learn like that and I guess my mum and my gran understood that and after school I went on this ridiculous journey like I did an NVQ in business and worked out okay cool so that's the way that you learn because I got a distinction on that then I did another NVQ I got a distinction on that but then I went back to try and do my A-levels and I, I left school <laughs> And I just found out that there was a particular way that I had to learn. And throughout all of this, my mum was supportive because I guess this is where I get my thing. Okay, people say to me, mad fly just flew in my mouth, live on the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's worse than my fly speaker. Fly just to flew. Put the fear of God into me. <laughs> um, and what what was I even saying? The fly just killed my just killed my vibe. Um, NVQ. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did a, a an NVQ, and basically, my mum said to me, like, find your path, like, find your way, find your journey. And I just went on this journey of just going from job to job. Like, I was a I was a pizza delivery boy. I worked um, at the local council. I was a lollipop man. Like I worked in a youth center. Like I did all of these jobs, but all of them were based or grounded in community and customer service and people. And if I didn't do all of them things, if my mom didn't give me the freedom to go out and work out what I was good at, I wouldn't, I, once again, I wouldn't be in this position here. So my advice to, a long way around it, my advice to young people is I would say finish school but if your parents are trying to force you into doing something beyond finishing school, because I do think you, you need to learn how to read and write. Like there are things that you need to learn to exist in the world that we live in. And I think even if it's not the current way of schooling, you should finish some kind of schooling. If you don't want to do a degree, you don't want to do an MVQ, cool. But get the skills that you need to be able to read, write and learn about the world. Um, and I think after that, the world is where you learn. Because half of the things that I now depend on, I didn't learn them in school. Like, I, I learned them on the roads. <laughs> or I learned them in my house. Or I learned them from friends. Or I learned them from mentors. Like, you get the, I guess, the some of the social skills from school from mixing with people, but that's not the, le that's not the lessons that you're learning. That's from people. That's from community. Um, so I think school is really, really important, but not just for education, for socialising and learning how to deal with people. Like, it's, school's supposed to be a melting pot, as is the world, so... Mm. Can I just add, um, sorry, um, 
I agree with you that people should finish school. I don't want it to, to sound like I was saying don't go to school because I definitely <laughs> finished school, went to college and, and I went to another college after that. And I, What I was going to say was, yeah, while I think in this country up to the age of 19, you get free education, I would say like use that, get as much as you can out of it because education, whether it's like, in maths or it's in dt or it's in graphic because i thought i i mean like stuff i learn in school or whatever or in college i definitely use some of those skills now and i definitely do you know what i mean so i would 100 mm. percent up until that was it a level or college age which i think is compulsory anyways but just try your best and make the most of it because it's only going to make your life easier it's not going to make your life more difficult to try and get good good um, grades or whatever. But yeah, free education, that is something that this, like we take for granted in this country. Because a lot um, of places, they don't realize get that. And they really value education. Yeah, they really value education. Um, but I also think that, um, yep, yeah, social skills is important. I think travel, if you can, if you're able and get the culture in and just learn from everything. Like when I left school, I'd done a, like, um, what did I do? Like a, a color course on what different body types, what colors they should wear, like so random, but it's learning. And it made me, my brain is expanding by getting that learning, do you know what I mean? So yeah, stay in school, do not quit. <laughs> Try your best, and then when you're 19, then you do whatever you want. You want to go uni, go uni. Because for some, um, even depending on what you want to do as an entrepreneur, you might need to go to university just to get that extra knowledge. So it depends on what you want to do. So yeah, I was sorry to add that bit. I definitely agree with the fact that like, real, there's no better experience than real world experience. Man. I think all of the things that have like enabled me to progress just as an adult, like. I learned just from doing outside of like any kind of education system. Yes, you need like the basic kind of like fundamentals to know, but there are certain situations that education just does not prepare you for. And like you can only learn through actually just putting yourself in those situations and seeing how they work. And when it comes to people, I feel like you need to know how to be, how to deal with human beings, other human beings, because that's like everything is about interconnectivity and networks and how everybody is connected. And I feel like that's one of the biggest skills that like if I'd say anybody needed to learn like the skill of networking and knowing how to ask for help have been the two for me personally two of the biggest like things that have changed the direction of my career which leads into the next question how did you build your network for job opportunities um along the way would be my <laughs> short answer um <laughs> Um, I'm really, really chatty person. I can talk to anyone, which is obviously helped me with my network. Um, but networking, like actually going to like networking events, I still find that so cringy and I absolutely hate it. I prefer like genuine organic, um, mm. conversations. Um, even for example, how we met Jams, yeah. like we just happened to work in an office together. Do you know what I mean? You was doing what you was doing, I was doing what I was doing, but we're like 10 years later, friends, very much good friends, work together, you do things for me, I do things for you. Do you know what I mean? So, and I think whether, even if we wasn't friends, I think we had a, we had a good working relationship anyways. Um, so I think don't burn bridges if you can, because I know sometimes it's hard. Um, <laughs> but try to keep it professional keep it cute all the time because at the end of the day it's going to affect your bag and you know? that's what so feelings shouldn't come into it i'm quite an emotional person and i had to learn the hard way that you can't be emotional in business because it's just it's not going to get i mean like in terms of if someone does something you can't take it personally that's what i mean when i say you can't be emotional in business um because it's, it's just business, like, and there's going to be a point in your career where you're going to have to do something that you, you might think, oh, I don't really feel like this is the right thing to do, but it actually, for your business, it is the right thing to do. So, lost my train of thought. What was that? No, I think I get what you're trying to say. I feel like that you should never really get too emotionally involved in business because at the end of the day, one, 
big misconception that sometimes people can have is that you know everybody's right. going to get along like we're, we're not here to get along it's business so it's all based on like mutual benefits sometimes there might be a situation that mutually benefits two parties if so yeah. then it's amazing but if not it's not personal it's just Fine, yeah, two different people doing what's best for them yeah. if it doesn't it's not it's not a conflict at all it's just you've gone to this uh you've gone in two separate directions you yeah, I mean? and if I see you out, I will definitely say hello and smile. Exactly. Because <laughs> manners. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> but I, I remember what I was going to say now to build your network. So when you work with someone, even if you just meet someone, like try to find out a little bit about them. Like look, I worked in a bank and someone will pay in the, when they're paying in their money and it's, you know, some machines are going slow. So what do you do? Oh, I'm a graphic designer. Oh my God, that's amazing. Like what types of things have you designed or who have you designed for? Da, 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 da. And have you got a business card or an email address or an Instagram page or whatever? Because you just never know when you might need someone like that in your life or, or they might need you. So it's always good to have conversation, get to know people a little bit and try. I know it's difficult, but that's what social media is a very good tool for, is to keep in touch with exactly. people. Even just by liking a picture. Like, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Do you know, you said something really interesting earlier. Um, when you were talking about, you know, how you decided what you wanted to do and it was, um, it wasn't even deciding on what you wanted to do. It's just saying that like, I want to help people, which is like a really good mm. premise to start any working relationship on like, how can I help you? Which is something obviously me and Corey have a lot of discussion about like, how can we help other people? And I feel like if you start any working relationship with that, it's a good positive place to kind of begin. Mm. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think, for me, the, the type of projects that I've done, you have to have a genuine heart to do it mm. because you're not going to want to work with young women that want to be business women or whatever if you don't actually care about them. So you might do it for that day for the event, but the longevity is not going to be there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. I've really, really tried to find people, other women that have the same ethos as me and have the same values and everything that like, I actually want to help. I, I want these girls to not have to do what I did, which is have to wait until I'm older. Do you understand what I'm saying? And even the kids that I work with now, they just want to just either rap, drill, or be a beautician, which are both fine things to do. But it's just about opening their mind that there's actually so much other things that A, you can do, and B, you should do or should try at least. So yeah, it's always about how, how can you help? Because it's always going to be, well, how can you help me now? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jams knows. <laughs> that's, that's where the mutual benefit comes in, like. And exactly. I think yeah, man. Exactly. And the world goes around just so much nicer when people are just nice to each other. Exactly. What about you, Corey? How did you build your network through running? Because obviously, I know you meet a lot of people day to day. Um, like, what's funny is I am, like, in the beginning, I am the complete opposite to you, Cleo. As in, I used to hate networking. I used to hate talking to people. I used to be invited, like, because of my old job, I would be invited to speak at places. And if I was due to come on to speak at 20 past six, I'm rolling in there at 16 minutes past, 17 minutes past. And then for the <laughs> remaining two minutes, I'm hiding somewhere until I'm called, just so I wouldn't have to speak to people. And then I'd do exactly the same thing when I was leaving, not because I was awkward, but because I didn't really want to talk to anybody. And that's not because I'm a bad person. I was just really introverted. And I know people see me jumping around and dancing now. I'm still an introvert. I still like sitting in my house, in, not in darkness, but, but in silence and chilling. <laughs> like I just want, sometimes I just want to chill. And that was the hardest part of learning how to network, actually realizing that these people who I do not know aren't scary and they are interested in, so it's once again that self-confidence, that finding value in what it is that you do, because you can't put yourself on stage, you can't put yourself on show unless you believe that what you're going to say, people are gonna be interested in. And like, that was when I started to build my network, when I actually realized that a network was not important, but it was valuable. And the reason why it's valuable is not because you can get stuff from it, but because you can help people in it. And in turn, they will help you. And that helping releases all of these beautiful endorphins, yeah. dopamine, all that yeah. sort of stuff, all of the happy stuff. Warms your that's heart. Why we're all on, exactly. 
And that's why yeah. we're all on this call because we're all happy people. <laughs> and when I say happy people, as in we enjoy like helping other people makes us happy. happy you know? yeah. And yeah. seeing yeah. other people help other people, it makes us happy. And then similar to what you said, is it's it's like this this circular effect. Like you continue to help people in your network, they help other people, they help other people. And then we get to this point where it's not even legacy, legacy, legacy. It's like just from your small act, like that ripple effect has gone on to help a bunch of other people. And like those people will come back and help you. And it's quite interesting. I was talking to Aisha from the call that we have on Monday, but I did the podcast with her jabs. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about when you work with young people or you work with adults or you're a coach or you're a leader, what you find is that the people that you've either coached or helped return to you, even though they don't need more coaching, they've now returned to for like for fellowship. They've returned to like now be your equal to now work with you. And that for me is testament to, to you doing something yes, awesome. Yeah, 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 like if you've got people... As in, because when you think about it, think back to school or youth centre, like, you all remember that one youth worker or teacher that was on your side and, like, went for you. And then you also mm. remember the nasty little Ross that made your life hell. <laughs> like, you don't really meet them people, you don't remember the people in the middle. And that, for me, like, that, for me, is, is, is what makes me smile. Like, that's what makes me continue networking, because I love hearing people's stories. Like, I have a genuine interest in humans. Like, I have a genuine interest in, like, how was your day? Like, what did you do? What did this make you feel? Like, I like yeah. studying people and all of that information, that puts you in a, in, a, in a better place when you're communicating with other people because that then, I guess, opens up or widens your palette of information, which means that you can get on with even more people. As in because of how we consume information, we could meet someone from Tibet and we would know something about something in Tibet. We would know something mm -hmm. to be able to have a conversation with that person about something because we've seen something about Tibet somewhere. And it works the same way with networking. Like, it doesn't matter if you think that information is important to you at that particular point in time. Like, just take it all. Yeah, take it all. Just take it, <laughs> just take it all in. No, honestly, because like you said, you just never know. You never know when you might need help with something or someone might need help with, for something that you can do. Yeah, having a network is good. And, and it I takes a village, isn't it? You know, like people say that with you raise a child, it takes a village. Like, even if it's just your business, it definitely takes a village. And if you've got amazing people that you can do this and that and help you with this and that and all these things, you're laughing. Um, I think it's also really important for people to look outside what they define as their own like box or their mm. own circle. As in, because all that happens is if you only surround yourself with people who are like you, you're in an echo chamber. So, of course, they're going to agree with your idea because <laughs> they think <laughs> like you. <laughs> I don't feel like you need, need people who are going to challenge your perspective on things because yeah. that's where yeah. growth lies. Do you know what I mean? Like, you need someone yeah. that's going to be like, nah, mate, that's terrible. Don't, don't, don't do anything with that because i love i love that friend or that colleague yeah. or whatever that just keeps it 100 his name it's is like, chop no yes <laughs> his name is chop and we, 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 we all need a chop in our lives yeah we all need like somebody who's gonna like tell you that no like this is absolutely rubbish like go and do it yeah. again yeah, yeah. and yeah and, and it's coming from a place of love as well yes yeah exactly yeah Right, oh, so right. I'm aware we're running a bit low on time, so we're going to go into the last question, which is actually a really important question. How did you transition from getting experience for free to getting paid for your work? Oh, child, this was a tough one. A good question. Because, yes, a very good question. So for me, um, it was, it, there was a, for me actually, it's when I had my son. Because before I had my son, I craved experience so much i would have done anything for mm. anyone i would have been the, i would have been the first one there 
I'll be the last one to go down with you know I used to go I was did the most I did absolute the most and I got so much from it and let me not take it away I think working for free gives you something that you just can't get yeah. So in other in other aspects of life. So I'm not I would never tell someone to not work for free. What I would say is know your worth. And when you know your worth, demand what you deserve. And when I became a mum, I was like, okay, well I'm not just doing it for me now. So if I'm gonna give you eight hours a day to book 20 artists or whatever it is I'm definitely going to need to get paid for that because I, I'm taking 8 hours of my day away from my child so I'm going to need something for that um, in, everyone else, in everyone's life it might be something different there might be another trigger where you think okay I'm sick at what I do so why the hell am I not getting paid for it or do you know what I mean like, there's, there's going to be some type of trigger where you're just like okay i've done i've been working for free i've got the experience now now i'm ready to start making some coins from it and i think when you get to that point you just have to have that confidence to because a lot of the time some people that you know love do you know what i mean friends or whatever so it's like i'm gonna need you to just just give me something it doesn't even need to be anything major because that that something then is going to hopefully turn into a bigger job with someone else that you don't that you don't necessarily know because you can you're building your portfolio all the free work you're doing you're building you're building your portfolio so i've done da 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 and guess what i've done that for free so imagine if you pay me what i'm going to give you yeah told you <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> and that's just what it is because I find I know what I'm, what I'm capable of when I'm not getting paid. So it's only going to be more. It's only going to be better if you're paying me. But yeah, just know your worth. Yeah. Know your worth, and when you do, ask for what you deserve or what you think you deserve. What about you, Corey? Um, I think I transitioned into getting paid for stuff when I needed to, if that makes sense. As in, so similar to yourself, I would have done stuff for free forever because I knew how much I was learning. I knew how much experience I was getting. I knew how much um, I was networking. But then when it got to a place, as in, so I wasn't doing stuff for free and, and felt like I was being abused, but it then got to a point where I was like, oh, okay, so I'm actually doing this at a, a reasonable level now. And I kind of know that people who, other people, who do this at this level, they get paid. As in, not we work for the same people and one person is getting paid and I'm not. It's more a case of, ah, oh, I know people who do this and, and they get paid. I wonder if I can get paid. So it was never even, uh, you must <laughs> give me this because I had no idea. <laughs> it was more of a case of, ah, oh, like, do you get paid for this? <laughs> and it was like, yeah, yeah, you get paid. I was like, oh, okay, like, how much you get paid? And we're like, oh, you probably get about this much. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then, like, that was literally the first time I got paid. But the reason why I was in that position was because I'd done so much stuff for free, both for myself and for other people. And that's what I say to a lot of people. Like, there are some people in a dragon's den somewhere that might disagree. But for me, if anyone comes to me with something, the first thing I'm going to ask them is, how much have you invested in it yourself? That's the first thing I'm going to ask you. What have you put in? And even if it's not money, even if it's not money, it's resources. Yeah, it's like blood, sweat, tears, time. Tears, all of that. Like if you can't tell me what you've done, I've, I've, got no, I've got no time for you. Unless you've got some special story as to why it ha hasn't happened. But my thing is, is to show that you're passionate about something to show that you like really believe in something you have to have invested in it yourself and there are loads of people who don't understand that because they'll come to to us and, for advice and say oh like how do i do this i want to do this i'm like have you done it yourself no no no, no it's just on paper now i want to know if you're, you're going to help and i was like of course i can help but i want you to bring it a little bit a yeah. little bit further first yeah um, yeah, because you can't want something for someone more than they want it for themselves. And if you're not willing to put in the work for yourself, why would I put yes. in whatever it is, work, money, time, advice, why would I do that? It makes no sense. So, yeah, you have to show something, definitely. Yeah, nobody wants to help anybody that 
doesn't want to help themselves. Like it's just like Corey was you're saying, not really helping them. You're actually hindering them. You're teaching yeah. them bad lessons. Like I can't be more passionate about your passion than you. Otherwise, why would I want to yes. get involved in your journey? Otherwise, shouldn't I be doing it then? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> should this I should be, be doing team? it. Exactly. This is it. And I think another kind of really good thing I did when I was kind of like coming up. Um, speak to other people, man, and just like see. Obviously, don't ask them exactly what they're getting paid, but see, like, say to them, "Look, I'm doing this thing. I know you're in this profession. What do you think I should be getting paid for this at this level?" Because um, sometimes what corporations and kind of big companies tend to do is they will only pay you what you ask for. So even if they do have the budget, so if you if you're doing a job that's worth a thousand pounds and you have a bit of imposter syndrome and you go in there and you ask for 200 pounds, they're going to be more than happy. They're not even going to tell you about the other 800 that they've got. That 800 pounds is at the bar there. now. Yeah, exactly. That 800 pounds doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> After work drinks. <laughs> yeah. They, I'll they try and bring you down time. to 150. <laughs> <laughs> they would, they would squeeze you. Yeah, they exactly. Would you. They'll say you need to, you need to hit this quota to get that extra 50 pounds. And you need to be firm. You need to be really firm and say, sometimes it's about knowing when to say no as well. Like, yes, I would love to do this job, but at this time, this just doesn't match my requirements. I'm sorry. And it might be a no, it might be hard to say no, but you know what? The next time that person comes back to you, they're going to know that they're going to have to play on equal on an equal playing field and pay you what you're worth. So sometimes turning down mm. stuff is not really bad at all. Sometimes it's actually much better for your career. Definitely. And on that note, I'm going to end it because we hit the 10 minute limit. But thank you both very much for taking part. That was a very, very good conversation. No, thank you for having um, me. Oh, thanks for people, having me. Where can people find you on socials? Um, I'm at Clea Kaziah on everything. That's K L E. all of it. Literally everything. Yeah, K L E O K I Z I A H. And that's, yeah, I'm on, that's me on everything. Corey. I'm sorry, and uh, me, <laughs> I am <laughs> I am bit beefy on everything. So that's B I T and then B E E F Y. Um, and Trap Mafia is Trap Mafia underscore on everything. Sweet. We're gonna leave it there. Make sure you follow H E Futures on Instagram. It's been Warrior Trap Mafia Hackney Empire. Thank you very much. Goodbye.